Good morning and welcome to this Max Bell School of Public Policy Lab Challenge presentation. I'd like to introduce myself, Sebastian Merman, as well as my team members, Sarah Lombard, Charlotte Koboul, and Riyad Katkoda, who comprised the team that had the honor to be working with the World Bank's Central Asia office on this policy lab challenge. Over the course of this project, we produced a large research report focused on the development of long-term power purchasing agreements in the Republic of Tajikistan. Today, we will highlight some of the complexities that were analyzed, a global case study that was conducted, and our principal recommendations across three primary areas of consideration. Here is a brief agenda of today's presentation, which will precede a Q&A portion to follow. Please take note of any questions you would like to ask. Tajikistan is a small landlocked country bordered by four nations within the Aral Sea Basin. It is currently expanding its large mountainous hydropower generation capacity with significant investment from the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. In terms of broadly presenting the challenge Tajikistan is confronted with, there are two major sides of the same coin to consider. First, Tajikistan suffers from chronically high electricity losses and high poverty approximately 200 million US dollars in economic losses or 3% of Tajikistan's GDP are incurred each year due to winter electricity shortages. And this gravely impacts the 27.4% of the population living below the poverty line. There are strong economic and poverty reduction goals in Tajikistan, and these cannot be met without reliable power supplies. Without reliable power, affordable electricity and affordable electricity throughout the year Tajikistan's businesses cannot invest, operate, and create jobs. Hospitals and schools cannot function fully or safely, with power cuts being frequent during the winter months. Citizens suffer indoor air pollution from burning wood for heating and cooking, and electricity shortages during the winter months are standard due to the seasonal availability of water resources, with some end users, most often family households, experiencing shortages of up to 70% of the time when conditions are extreme. Compared to this unfortunate reality, the irony is that Tajikistan sits on a large potential hydropower reserve that is underutilized. Just to emphasize this point a bit more, in terms of potential hydropower resources, Tajikistan has estimated generation potential of more than three times the consumption in the Central Asian region. Tajikistan ranks first as the country in the world with the greatest hydropower potential per square kilometer and second in the world in hydro potential per person. So Tajikistan has clear high production potential, but low capacity for sharing these resources with neighbors. These exports to neighboring countries present a significant economic growth opportunity. And this process can be facilitated by long-term power purchasing agreements, also known as PPAs. A power purchasing agreement is a contract between two parties, one who produces or generates power for sale, known as the seller or producer, and one who seeks to purchase power, the buyer or off-taker. PPAs are therefore sometimes referred to as off-take agreements. However, there are multiple complexities in initiating, attaining, and maintaining such agreements. The mandate of our report included analysis and recommendations to mitigate relevant economic, legal, and governance risks for PPAs. The target export markets were Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Uzbekistan. We considered the primary economic factors for long-term future hydro generation and transmission, as well as the potential risks. Second, the institutional prerequisites for profitable hydro energy exports and a review of current governance structures. And finally, the principal legal risks to consider before engaging in long-term PPA negotiations with neighboring countries. Forecasting our final recommendations, there are distinct activities in each of these that we have suggested based on best practices. The approach to PPA negotiations has to be tailored to the context energy sector. There are three distinct branches of any energy sector's operations, generation, transmission, and distribution. Different complexities apply when different parties own or operate the different branches of the energy sector. In international electricity exports, there are also jurisdictional issues as the transmission lines frequently cross international borders. 
Under PPAs, energy can be purchased by a foreign generator, such as Afghanistan state-owned energy company, or by a transmission company, such as Pakistan's National Transmission and Dispatch Company. The structure of the energy sector therefore shapes the consequential risk and mitigation mechanisms of any agreement. Based on this, focus in our case study was given to generation and transmission subsystems in Tajikistan and in comparable contexts with the aim of identifying useful recommendations applying to this sector. Our scope focused on wholesale purchasing, meaning direct in bulk generator sales to other energy companies, rather than retail purchasing to consumers and other end users. In recent decades, Tajikistan has undergone major energy sector reforms. These include ongoing reforms to recalibrate tariff structures and an aim at increasing efficiency writ large across the sector. A reorganization has determined the Tajik Anti-Monopoly Committee as a temporary regulator, and under the 2019 restructuring plans, an independent regulator will be established to replace the Anti-Monopoly Committee, although this is not anticipated to occur in the short term. New transmission and distribution entities have also been created, moving towards a process known as unbundling. Smaller, separate entities are known as a better governance practice and also facilitate the possibility of future privatization. Finally, new legislation has been created surrounding renewable energy source management and concessions, allowing for greater expansion of the sector in Tajikistan. Next, we will map the current structure of the Tajik energy sector. The Central Power Corporation of Tajikistan is called Barki Tojik, or BT for short, and it oversees energy planning and policy making in the country. Barki Tojik generates 95% of the total power in the country and has smaller energy sharing agreements with several domestic and minor companies. The government of Tajikistan, through the Ministry of Energy and Water Resources, is the primary body with approval power for tariffs and centrally controls the sector, despite vertical unbundling. The newly created transmission and distribution companies still have a long way to go before becoming fully independent. The distribution company, Shabakahoi Taksimoti, currently has an external request for proposals out for a management contract, and the restructuring of the sector may be open to potential future privatization beyond the next five years. Now, Sarah is going to give us a bit more about where Tajikistan is at in terms of their PPA development. Thanks, Seb. Um, so I'm going to talk you through Tajikistan's journey to long-term PPAs and where the country is up to in this transition. So Tajikistan currently has short-term energy export agreements with Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, which are reviewed on an annual basis. With Afghanistan, pricing is fixed for the long term and capacity commitments are reviewed annually. With Uzbekistan, price and energy quantities are renegotiated each year. Uzbekistan actually withdrew from the Soviet grid in 2009, but restarted importing electricity from Tajikistan from April 2018. These informal short-term agreements give Tajikistan limited certainty over cash flows or the ability to offload surplus power in the summer. The short-term basis also contributes to a lack of regional integration. The second landmark on Tajikistan's journey to long-term PPAs was the CASA 1000 network. This is a 13,000 megawatt transmission line connecting Tajikistan, the Kyrgyz Republic, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Tajikistan is predicted to provide approximately 70% of energy under the network. And PPAs accompany the project, such as the 2015 15-year agreement between Pakistan and Tajikistan. Tajikistan's next aim to attain long-term bilateral PPAs to complement agreements under the CASA 1000. Long-term PPAs are very desirable globally. They're described as bankable, which means that they attract lenders and encourage private investment into a country's energy sector. Long-term agreements provide certainty that there will be revenue and cash flows. They can contribute to maintaining a country's sovereign credit rating and can be regarded as green, demonstrating a commitment to renewable forms of energy. The secondary consequence of long-term PPAs is that they assist in building trust and relations between countries, paving the way for further trade deals, cooperation, and wider regional integration. 
Whilst there are significant upsides to long-term PPAs, their long-term nature enhances the associated risks to the parties involved. This means that it can be difficult to obtain commitment and the crafting of a PPA is ultimately a trade-off between certainty and flexibility, both of which bring individual benefits. So, our approach was to cover global case studies, which were selected using a structured review. This was a purposeful broadening of our initial approach when we had focused on case studies suggested by the World Bank and our coach. Our review was a five-stage process outlined on this slide, and the most effective component for identifying wide-ranging case studies was the academic databases search, which is at the center at the top of this diagram. This utilized seven academic databases to answer the outlined question below. Are there case studies not previously identified, which have best practices in hydroelectricity export management, which can be transferred to the Tajik context? We then applied filtering criteria to the results, and in considering each case study, there were two tests we applied. Firstly, if there is a policy learning that can be taken from a success or failing. Secondly, whether it can be applied to Tajikistan. The second test captured the major consideration of policy transferability. Whilst Hydro-Quebec had a number of lessons which can be applied for Tajikistan's purposes, we wanted to find further experiences which had greater circumstantial similarity to Tajikistan. So to give you an example, um, we identified that France is a large hydroelectricity producer. However, there's almost no literature covering their export activities. In contrast, Germany was included in our case studies due to the existence of literature and links to the Scandinavian market, Austria and Switzerland. To give you an idea of our process, our structured review of the academic databases identified 35 countries, and these were then filtered down by, by applying the two tests I outlined on the previous slide. This led us to consider the five continents and 10 subregions that are highlighted on this map. For each case study included, there are a number of transferable lessons which contributed to our analysis and recommendations. Some of them are specific, such as the regulatory structure identified from the Ivory Coast, which is particularly effective in attracting and retaining private investment. Other practices arose repeatedly across numerous contexts, and we've summarized many of these common lessons into the three pillars which Sebastian outlined earlier. So firstly, in the legal segment, we identified alignment of purpose and needs from an export agreement as a fundamental component. This requires verifying your assumptions when you're entering into negotiations. We saw this firstly in Europe, where Germany and Poland had differing priorities, different motivations for prioritizing renewable energy development. Secondly, we then saw this in the South African power pool, where Zimbabwe attained shorter agreements with Mozambique on the false assumption that other projects would be completed by the export agreement's expiration date. Thirdly, in negotiations between Quebec and Maine, both parties falsely assumed that international exports could be prioritized over domestic agreements for energy provision. So poor verification of assumptions or the failure to allocate risks between parties results in negative outcomes, including disputes, costly delays, and poor results for end consumers. Secondly, for the economic considerations, cost recovery was universally the fundamental starting point for successful PPA tariffs. The various models we then saw provide a balance between flexibility and revenue or energy certainty, which suit the particular context. Thirdly, for governance, independent institutions, oversight bodies, and transparent reporting were common themes. The distinguishing factor in advancing regional integration has been the willingness of countries to cooperate in establishing legal frameworks for operations. For example, the West African power pool successfully established market rules, joining conditions and template PPAs, whilst the Central African power pool has failed to meet its deadline for establishing basic market structures and can ultimately be characterized as a failing effort at market integration. So next, Riyad will talk you through our policy proposals to tackle PPA negotiations and the associated risks. Thank you, Sarah. So we use the guiding principles outlined by Sarah to come up with three broad policy recommendations. 
the recommendations are further dissected into specific outputs aimed at aiding the government of Tajikistan in realizing their objective of securing long-term PPAs. All three recommendations aim to enhance the management of economic, legal, and governance risks associated with hydroelectric export negotiations. Detailed explanation and rationale behind these three recommendations are outlined in the following slides, and a clear action plan for Tajikistan has been detailed in our report. For the sake of timing, we shall cover the three main action points in each section and are happy to answer any questions that you might have. On the legal side, we recommend that Tajikistan develop a negotiations plan for each potential counterparty country. This will allow Tajikistan to better position itself for negotiations and would aid in determining its stance on each legal clause included in the agreement. This translates into two distinct uh, activities. The first is the preparation of legal clauses to determine Tajikistan's stance on each risk and liability point within a PPA. The second is understanding the counterparty's position, which requires verifying assumptions such as underlying interests, potential conflict areas, and potential walkaways. On the economic side, we recommend that Tajikistan determine an export tariff structure based on a dual energy charge and capacity charge. On governance, we recommend the commencement of regional integration discussions in addition to early stakeholder engagement. All governance considerations have been grounded in principles of transparency and independence based on the case studies that we have reviewed. Charlotte will expand on both the economic and governance considerations in the following slides, uh, but before that, I will detail for you the legal recommendations. So as mentioned earlier, these comprise of two distinct outputs. The first is the preparation of legal clauses, as this exercise will help in assessing the terms and conditions that Tajikistan is willing to accept or concede to in order to attain an agreement. We have highlighted the most important legal clauses to be included in a PPA within a risk matrix. This includes the allocation of risk based on the clauses identified and the involved trading partners most eligible to mitigate that risk. A sample has been provided in the slides before you, and as you can see, the matrix shows the clauses, subclauses, responsible party, and the level of risk based on what we have seen from our case studies. We have also provided additional guidance for the Tajik officials on what to consider when developing such clauses so that they can easily replicate them for any future trading partner. While our clauses are not comprehensive, they provide a starting point for Tajikistan to build on in preparing for PPA negotiations. This matrix includes clauses such as length of contract, renewal and delivery, force majeure and political risk management, disputes settlement, audit and monitoring clauses. And just to go one level deeper and show you the analysis that we have done, as part of our dispute settlement clauses, we recommended the utilization of three soft dispute settlement mechanism frameworks within PPAs. As you know, the choice of dispute settlement mechanisms is essential in protecting bilateral relationships when disputes inevitably arise. And giving Tajikistan options allows them to select the mechanism that better suits them in any future agreement being negotiated. One option, and as highlighted by one of our agent case studies, was the utilization of the UN Commission on International Trade Laws Arbitration Rules. This seemed to be the best suited to serve Tajikistan's purpose due to its flexibility and overarching nature in application, covering disputes between a variety of entities under one umbrella. We also recommended the use of the International Center for Settlement of International Di Disputes, which is a body under the World Bank as well as a joint fact-finding mission as part of the other options. As for our second output, and to go in line with the legal clause preparations, we recommend that Tajikistan understands the risk appetites of its future counterparties. In doing so, Tajikistan must identify the areas of possible agreement with counterparties by understanding their position, concerns, and interests. In addition, they will also need to uncover interests in other areas such as trade, infrastructure maintenance, and security to help reach a more comprehensive agreement. Uh, to provide a more practical instrument for this negotiation preparation, we have prepared a preliminary framework of negotiation plans between Tajikistan and the countries outlined in our scope of work based on the Harvard negotiations framework. These two outputs and the subsequent analysis that we have provided 
give you a brief insight into our legal recommendations. I will now pass it on to Charlotte to cover the economic and governance recommendations in more details. Thank you, Rian. So for our economic recommendation, we first advise Tajikistan to adopt a flexible capacity-based export tariff structure. This is twofold. First, export partners pay a capacity charge, which covers the opportunity cost of making the dam capacity available to the buyer for electricity generation. The second component is called the energy charge, which represents the cost associated with producing the amount of electricity that will actually be traded between the countries. And that typically reflects the variable cost of electricity generation. A combined capacity and energy charge ensures flexibility for both the buyer and the seller, and it also protects the producer from potential fluctuation in demand. As technology has improved, it now allows for a better assessment of capacity needs and constraints. So we see this tariff methodology being increasingly used worldwide. We cite in our case studies in Africa, Asia, and North America. And this is primarily because it's simply more reflective of electricity generation cost structures. One alternative model is a fixed quantity tariff structure, where there's a set amount of electricity to be traded at a set price. And if this is coupled with what is called a take or pay clause, the buyer is forced to purchase a predetermined amount of electricity, regardless of whether it uses it or not, which is quite inefficient. Instead, our recommendation mirrors the recently reformed domestic tariff structure in Tajikistan that has both, both this capacity and energy charge that, that I mentioned. This export tariff methodology also enables an easier transition towards an eventual market-based system once the region um, grid becomes more integrated. To implement this export tariff, it is paramount for Tajikistan to first finalize its own domestic tariff structure. That means evaluating the reforms that were recently put in place, such as electricity metering and loss reduction investment. Without doing these evaluations, it's impossible for the domestic tariff and the export tariff to be truly cost reflective, which means that the government will have to end up subsidizing them and increasing its debt, which is precisely what we're trying to avoid here. Tajikistan should ground the quantities that it plans on exporting in careful assessment of domestic demand trends. Because of the persistent winter shortages that we mentioned earlier, we believe that Tajikistan should consider implementing Hydro-Quebec's heritage pool framework where there's a set quantity of electricity de dedicated to domestic consumption and only amounts in excess of this quantity can actually be exported. The final economic consideration is to avoid, if possible, direct cross subsidization using price discrimination. This means avoiding that either the domestic consumers or the export consumers end up paying artificially low tariff for the other group. Affordable domestic prices can still be achieved indirectly with the profit made from export to be held in a separate account, and decisions about how to use that money should be also carried out separately. Moving on to our governance recommendations. As for government recommendations, we propose that Tajikistan focuses mainly on two things, um, regional integration and stakeholder management, which we have seen uh, both to be very important in PP negotiations. To achieve the first step, the regional integration, Tajikistan should start dialogue with a small number of countries through the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, or CAREC in short, which is the most um, established regional organization. Discussion under CAREC should focus on creating an energy-specific branch that would be made up of all the member countries, but most importantly, that would be completely independent from any one of these countries' energy sectors. Discussion should include matters of joint ownership, member quotas, decision-making committees, and staffing requirements. By focusing on regional integration, we really believe that Tajikistan could benefit from having a first mover advantage in setting the regional agenda and its objectives. This is, a, um, for example, Tajikistan can lead the discussion around the regional transmission, tariff methodology, the transmission capacity disclosures, and market principles. Aiming for regional integration would not only be good for the entire Central Asian region, but it will also greatly help uh, position Tajikistan in its negotiation of PPAs. Um, this is something that we saw being very effectively done in the West Africa Power Pool that how, now has a completely transparent legal and governance framework available online. An independent regulator overseeing the regional agreements should also be established to ensure that there's no politicization of the governance bodies and that we can expect kind of a harmonization between tariffs and um, conditions for the member countries. 
Administrative independence of governance institutions is central to all of our recommendations. Our second key bucket under governance is considerations for stakeholder management. Holding consultation and creating two-way communication strategies with key stakeholders prior to starting the negotiation can really help prevent potential opposition to the agreements. This is something that was highlighted by Hydro-Québec uh, as being one of the key but often the most overlooked step in PPA negotiations. So reaching out to stakeholders early before the, the negotiation design is finalized is very important. Effective communication campaigns are another way to help secure support from domestic uh, consumers and also stakeholders. In the case of Hydro-Québec, targeted public relation campaigns have been found to be a very cost-effective measure in the long run. To assist in all of these reforms, we advise that Tajikistan join an organization that's called the International Hydropower Association or Barki Tajik. This particular industry association provides its members with cooperative platform and gives them access to central sources of information, but also expert committees, training, and fast response support. We also believe that Tajikistan should follow their protocols on governance planning because they're really thought to be the industry best practices. Enrolling Barki Tajik's executives in IHA training on these standards could also signal to the, the seriousness of the governance reform taking place to the trading partners. Finally, Tajikistan should consider launching an open data platform where it would make available all newly signed PPAs, but also production capacity, financial statements. This would increase transparency, which we believe is paramount in the effort to build trust in the region. Now let me pass it on to Sarah for our concluding remarks. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, so our three themed recommendations are accompanied with a detailed action plan. Each suggestion is supported by experiences drawn from the global case study practices, which were identified through our structured review. We believe that these steps will contribute to attaining successful long-term PPAs between Tajikistan and Afghanistan, Pakistan and Uzbekistan. We'd like to thank the World Bank for making this project available to us and to our coach Pierre-Olivier for his continued support. Also, thank you to you all for listening. We'd now like to invite any questions. Thank you, team. Uh, that was excellent. Very interesting coverage of a, a quite um, complex issue. We're going to begin the Q&A period now. We're going to start with the team coach, Pierre Olivier, who has, who has accompanied and supported the team uh, marvelously over the course of the last six months. Uh, also the chair of the Ener Energy Sector Management from HSC here in Montreal. Um, Pierre Olivier, do you have a question for the team? Uh, of course I do. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I'd like to start by just saying that the report is is, is actually very uh, useful and interesting beyond Tajikistan. It's, it, I think it will be useful for Tajikistan, but the, the breadth of the case studies and the coverage of the case studies is relevant for an international audience and as well as the PP analysis is, uh, is of course useful for Tajikistan, but the, the quality of the analysis of PPAs and case studies is really something that uh, I think could be useful for, uh, for more than Tajikistan. So the report is in that sense, uh, uh, and then from my perspective, uh, more than meets um, the mandate's objectives. Uh, but what I'd like to ask the team first is, is from all the case studies you've seen, is there one single uh, case study of best practice that, that you found more inspiring or that you would recommend as being the case study uh, to follow? I'm happy to take that one. Um, so as part of our mandate, there was quite a strong emphasis on uh, wanting to take learnings from Hydro-Quebec. So we did, we did find quite substantial lessons from there and also managed to consider more advanced energy markets such as the Nordic region and Europe by considering them and at that earlier stage of development for transferability. Um, I would say one that we found particularly useful and in some ways surprising was the West African power pool, just because the framework that they have for their both legal conditions and just the governance framework and the level of transparency which accompanies that was quite astounding compared to other developing contexts that we saw in other case studies. So that was particularly useful for seeing 
what's possible when you do governance and transparency really well. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Pierre Olivier, for that question, and thank you for all the support you provided the team. Um, I have uh, an opportunity. If anybody from the World Bank is on the line, if you could turn on your mic and your video, if you have any questions, please do. Um, and we're also going to open questions for faculty. So if we have faculty members that are online and have questions, if you can open up your camera and your mic and we'll proceed to questions there. So Chris, I see you have a question. I see Jennifer also has a question, and I see Ian Peach also has a question. So Chris, let's begin with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, team. A very impressive presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm struck, I suppose, by, uh, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm struck by how many moving pieces there are in this and how complex it all is. And I guess that my question, um, you each might have a different answer to this question. Okay, uh, so you don't have to give me four answers. But my question is this, of your biggest recommendations, because you have many, of your biggest recommendations, which one do you think confronts the most obstacles or the single biggest obstacle? What is it? Why is this one so difficult? I'm happy to go. Um, and we might indeed have different views on this question, um, but personally from all the research that we've done and from the understanding of the Tajik context that we have, I think that um, the recommendations under governance are probably the most challenging ones. So there are currently agreements with, um, between the countries that were mentioned. There seems to be a problem with transparency around how the state utility in Tajikistan is managed and governed. And there have been numerous attempts at um, changing how it is managed and how transparent its operations are. So this is why we have a particular focus on governance in our report. And we really tried to find recommendations that work in other similar contexts of where you start, you start from a, uh, a context of uh, high levels of corruption, for example, little transparency, um, and difficulty engaging with key stakeholders. So we took uh, lessons from different regions and we tried to apply some flexible but very transparent governance structure. So I think that would be, um, in my opinion, would be the most challenging section of our, of our recommendation section. Does anybody else want to give a different answer? Just, okay. Oh, Riyadh? I mean, uh, I, I would echo that and just say that um, in terms of also negotiating the PPAs themselves, so trying to find the legal setup and clauses that would match both counterparties in striking a deal, that is um, extremely difficult. And what we tried to provide was sort of a, a basis on uh, what Tajikistan can build on in these uh, negotiation preparation plans. Uh, to help them get where they want to be. Because there's a lot of demand in the region, and if um, executed properly, you can see that there's a lot of potential. Thank you. So we are now going to move on to Jennifer, who has a question for the team. Jennifer Welsh, go ahead. Hi. It's great to see you all. Excellent job. I have to say, I'm so sad you couldn't go to Tajikistan. Your last slide looks like Lake Louise, so it it, it makes you want to uh, it makes you want to go. Um, my question it won't surprise you. My question, uh, because some of you have spent a term with me, so I'm very interested in how much success of what you're recommending rests on successful regional integration because this isn't uh, Maine that is Tajikistan's neighbor. It's Afghanistan and it's Pakistan and it's a very unstable region. 
So I wonder how you, um, how you factor in success of regional integration as being the kind of key to making this all work. And as a, a kind of side question to that, how much political risk factored into some of your, your analysis? Thank you so much, Professor, for that question. Um, in terms of um, potential regional integration, there's a huge uh, demand supply gap in both countries that you have mentioned. So there is willingness for them to um, want more energy and there's a huge supply potential in Tajikistan to provide that. So it all depends on the levels of conversations that they're willing to have with the counterparties. And that's why we focused on our governance section on um, enhancing economic cooperation in an existing body in order to facilitate that. Um, on political risk, we actually have an entire appendix that was dedicated to that based on the World Bank governance indicators that look at uh, um, sub indicators such as the rule of law, um, pol political stability, and, and approximately six to seven other sub indicators to provide us sort of an idea of what Tajikistan would be getting into in these negotiations. And in order to mitigate that, we have added clauses for political risk and force majeure um, so that they are able to mitigate such risks. And an example that comes to mind is um, an example in Africa where Mozambique's first PPA was uh, suspended after a few years because uh, under a force majeure clause, there has been sabota sabotage of the transmission lines uh, to South Africa. And in order to mitigate that, given that Afghanistan is a volatile region or country, um, we have included such clauses in our recommendations. Mm. Okay. Really Thank you, Jennifer, for that great question and uh, Riyadh for the answer. We are now going to move on to Ian Peach. Ian, if you can turn on your video, Oh, you've changed your locale. Yes, I've gone outside. It's nice and warm in Fredericton today. Thanks everyone for a really good presentation. I'll let the motorbike go by Regent Street before I continue. Uh, anyway, really good presentation. I'm interested particularly in the important, what I think is an, a really important recommendation to in negotiations structure the tariff arrangements so that there's no cross subsidization. That makes good sense to me. Essentially, it's a national treatment provision. In broad based trade agreements, national treatment provisions work, I would say because each party can provide something to the others. There, there's trade going on. So if you don't engage in national treatment, there's opportunity for retaliation but this is a one-way flow so I'm curious how you how you make a national treatment provision work in these PPA arrangements I mean one of the things I thought of that you mentioned afterwards was the increased transparency uh, you know, I can see the argument that greater transparency makes for uh, more uh, more fair arrangements, um, but will increase transparency take care of the tariff problem or would it scare away potential purchasers? Does Tajikistan have enough of, an, of a monopoly in production that uh, nobody's going to get scared away from dealing with them? subsidization in your tariff structure idea work? I can take that. Um, Ian, you cut at the end, so I hope I'm going to answer your question. Um, if I understand it, you, how do we understand cross-subsidization and what to avoid in Tajikistan? And maybe you want to go That's right. How do, how do you make the cross-subsidization rule work? Okay. So yeah. what's happening? So cross-subsidization under PPAs can occur in two in two sets two ways actually. You can have uh, domestic consumers ending up subsidizing exports, or you can have the opposite. You can have exports ending up subsidizing uh, domestic tariffs. So in developing countries, and most probably in the case of in Tajikistan, it would be higher, relatively higher 
export tariffs, ending up subsidizing um, lower tariffs for poor consumers in, in Tajikistan. So in, in order to mitigate that, we, we advised um, the World Bank and the Ministry of Energy to not have export revenues specifically included in the formula to, be, to calculate the domestic tariffs. That's where you see that direct cross subsidization, which we think is dangerous because volatil if there is volatility in exports, then you have impacts, direct impacts on, on domestic, um, domestic tariffs. So what we are trying to do by saying that there shouldn't be this direct link, it doesn't mean that domestic tariffs cannot be indirectly, if we can say subsidized, if the money from exports can be put in separate accounts and then decisions on how to use that money is carried out separately, then you can still have low domestic, relatively low domestic prices and that money can be utilized to, let's say, th this is just an example, but there's a targeted uh, social assistance program in Tajikistan. It was launched in 2011. Um, it still has a narrow scope in terms of the number of people that it reaches, but money can be put in that account, which is uh, then money that is um, given to the poorest household to ensure that there's no electricity poverty. Electricity poverty is defined as when people have to, pen, to spend more than 10% of their income on electricity. Uh, so rising tariffs domestically could lead to more uh, domestic, um, electricity poverty and we want to mitigate that. We don't want to, to put people in these positions. So the having no direct link between the export tariff structure and the domestic tariff structure is very important. Um, what we are considering, what we consider in the, the, our report is however, um, kind of dedicating a certain amount of electricity for domestic consumption before exports can actually, uh, so just has to ensure that exports are not prioritized if there are electricity shortages in Tajikistan. That would help with um, also general public acceptability of exports. Um, and you pointed out rightly that transparency is very important in all of this process. So making available all these financial statements and this, these decisions is actually a way to signal to partners that um, there are no cross subsidization or there at least transparency in how you calculate the price. And at this point, we believe that in Tajikistan, it's the lack of transparency that is hurting more than too much transparency. So. Uh, it wouldn't scare away uh, potential trading partners. I think what is scaring away is not having kind of a good insight of how these prices are calculated. That was a long answer, sorry. Thank you, <laughs> no, Ian. Thank, Thank you, you, Charlotte, for your answer. That was, that was excellent. Um, we have Farida from the World Bank team in Tajikistan that has a question for you. Um, Farida, if you could turn on your sound. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for the wonderful presentation. It was indeed really interesting. To, and, uh, you know, uh, I was just, you know, amazed listening to, to the recommendations you are offering for, for my country. And um, my question is, uh, given that uh, Gaza 1000 is uh, mainly focusing on the urban area, and given the, the poverty rate of the you know, uh, of the areas, of the rural areas um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, where people are living, you know, with extreme poverty, to what extent the so-called so same uh, recommendation uh, would be applicable, um, given, and uh, given, you know, the, the tariff structure for experts um, would, would, it, would it work and how it would, you know, bring a win-win uh, benefit to both, to both parties? I mean, to Tajikistan and Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan on the other side. Hi, Farida. So uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, so that's probably one of the reasons why we've um, had a partial consideration of privatization because um, a key factor in attracting private investment is ensuring that these long-term agreements are in place because they increase the attractiveness of entering the market for certain companies. And so having that additional investment coming into the energy market allows you to increase the transmission and distribution networks, which in turn means that you can access a greater number of households and general consumers. 
Um, so while we've considered, while we did consider the structure of the existing CASA 1000 PPAs in our proposed structure, um, we've turned more to focus on kind of extending the new domestic methodology so that it is definitely going to be cost reflective and has the same dual capacity energy charge to mirror the domestic context. Um, and hopefully some of the capabilities which have been built in negotiating the CASA 1000 PPAs can also be leveraged to creating new bilateral agreements which will benefit um, the parties involved in the negotiations. Thank you, Farida. Thank you, Sarah, for that answer. I have a quick question, and then we'll move on to Genoa, who also has a question. So my question is, you identified your dual filter as you went through your exhaustive case study research, the filter being best practices and those that were applicable to the context of Tajikistan. I wondered what best practices did you identify that would not apply to the context of Tajikistan? And if you could speak a little bit to those. I can take this one. <clears throat> That's right. So um, our, our methodology involved um, looking at um, several different regional contexts, um, several of which are highly, highly integrated at this point and involve um, um, uh, several decades worth of pre-existing negotiations, both within and uh, outside of larger economic communities, such as the Eurozone. Um, so for example, the Nordic region um, and the European zone, as well as some of the North American and, and South American markets um, were highly developed. And therefore the transferability um, was a bit lacking as well as at the very, very early stages. So there are some examples uh, of countries that um, were eliminated in our methodology due to the fact that they were not in a position to export, had very low hydro, hydropower capacity, or were just simply very um, different uh, demographics or um, regional settings such as islands or, or other countries. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Sebastian. Genoa, if you could turn on your sound and your video and ask your question to the team. Thank you. Oops. All right. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering, for our project, we also studied other jurisdictions to learn from their best practices. And I think when you're doing this kind of work, it's you, you might find best practices that are not applicable to this situation you're trying to apply to. So how did you determine that those those recommendations that you de decided were applicable to Tajikistan and weren't like, like, how did you know that the con it was going to work in the context of Tajikistan? Thank you, Genoa, for that question. So, in what we did, we tried to provide a roadmap sort of uh, towards better integration in both the short, medium, and long run. So some recommendations might need other prerequisites that we have recommended in order to be fulfilled. And that was sort of the um, idea behind how we structured the recommendations. And in both uh, or in all economic, legal, and governance uh, recommendations, we provided an action plan in the report that details steps for them to be able to tackle them. Also, Genoa, um, what we did is, so we looked at these very integrated markets and some contexts that were kind of far away from the Tajikistan context, but we saw that as being maybe the longer term kind of end goal. And then we looked at these same places and we went back in history to look at what were the first steps that they took to get to that level of integration. So it wasn't really about studying, you know, Europe or North America today. It was more about studying these, these regions 20, 30 years ago what happened with um, you know, the first kind of negotiation that they had and after was situating where Tajikistan is because Tajikistan has agreements in the region also. So it was trying to find where exactly they were and how these cases could kind of provide a roadmap really towards you know, eventually achieving these very, very integrated markets. Thank you, Genoa, for your question and team for your answer. We have another question from the audience, Shirley Zhang. If you can turn on your audio and your camera, and then I'll be asking Chris and Pierre Olivier to come back as well. They, they have some nagging questions left for you before we close. So Shirley, go ahead. 
Can you, hi, you mentioned that like stakeholder engagement in your presentation, like how um, would Tajikistan deal with internal or external opposition to PPA negotiations? Okay, I can maybe answer this one. Is that right? Um, so the, the negotiation of PPA agreements is the central priority of the president of Tajikistan. Um, and what we found in our research is that uh, internal opposition, stakeholder management, both within the country and um, with others, um, is replicated in other case studies, such as Hydro-Quebec dealing with the state of Maine. Um, and that, like the European energy community um, about 10, 20 years ago, um, electricity is the kind of lowest common denominator between uh, countries that may not traditionally see eye to eye, as is the case with uh, Tajikistan and, and um, some neighbors, um, and um, is really the kind of key to unlocking tr larger trade in the Central Asia region. So, um, Shirley, in terms of your question about stakeholder engagement, um, I think we've mentioned the, the advantage of being an early mover and being an agenda setter and a leader. Um, and um, beginning talks around tariffs and around um, reliable energy source management are kind of the, the ways to um, uh, involving stakeholders in those discussions at an early stage is really, really important. Thank you, Shirley, for your question and Sebastian for the answer. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Chris. Uh, so Chris, if you can turn on your video and your mic back on, and Pierre Olivier as well, if you could turn your mic and your video back on. We have a few minutes left for, for some last questions. Chris, do you want to begin? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I want to <clears throat> come back to the issue of cross-subsidization. Uh, so in response to Ian's question, Charlotte, I think you basically said that you're not opposed to cross-subsidization, but you want to make sure that there's not a link between the domestic price and the external price. <clears throat> so it seems to me there needs to be no link. That's fine. Um, but I would have thought that there would be political, a political payoff to actually having a lower domestic price, especially if energy poverty is an issue and you suggested that it was. Um, and to the extent that Tajikistan has some price setting ability in its foreign markets, there would be an economic case for charging a higher price externally. So I guess my question is, uh, does it have that price setting ability in the foreign markets? And if it does, are you actually gonna recommend now uh, some cross subsidization, a lower price domestically, a higher price on exports? So price discrimination in itself is, is not really a problem here where we saw the real risk was that direct link that I mentioned in the formula. <laughs> because if you have, which is currently the case in the formula for the tariff domestically, you have uh, an amount set for the export revenues. This is dangerous in some ways when uh, it would make sense, but it, it is dangerous because if something happens to the export, the revenues, then what you met and ha end up having like spikes in, in prices domestically. However, um, I believe that Tajikistan has some leeway in, in tariff setting externally. It's important to note though that um, price sensitivity uh, and elasticity of demand for the, ex, uh, the importers is um, quite important because there are other options. Um, however, Tajikistan has the ability to, to provide kind of stable, stable uh, electricity provision, which is something that the entire region needs. Uh, so they have the ability to set these prices. It wouldn't be direct cross subsidization as, as I said, that the export should really be used um, separately. And the decision about how that money is used shouldn't be to, to purposefully lower the domestic tariffs, but it could be to help different groups pay their bills, pay their, pay their electricity bills. So the targeted uh, assistance program that I mentioned could be a way to reach the people that would be most affected by increasing domestic tariffs. So not direct cross subsidization. Um, it's, it's like a cap and trade, <laughs> direct rebates to some groups. <laughs> thank you, Chris, and thank you, Charlotte, for that. Uh, Pierre Olivier, we have a few minutes left. Um, 
ask, ask the final question of the session as we close the policy lab for this team for the first year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, so the team, you, you were supposed to go to Tajikistan to basically meet uh, local actors and, and you know, get more acquainted with uh, the society and the challenges there. You, you know, obviously you are a team of a foreign student to Tajikistan, uh, making a report to the World Bank, which is itself is an international organization uh, trying to help the Tajik government. Uh, if, if you were in a position to advise another team on your situation, what kind of advice would you make to make sure that your, their report would basically hit the target, which ultimately is the Tajik government, given the fact that you know, it's hard to, to help from outside uh, and it's not easy to, you know, you know, to make sure we understand and uh, internalize all the, the, the contextual uh, constraints of the country. So what kind of advice, given your experience and, and, and the reports you've read and, and your interactions with Tajikistan, what kind of advice would you give another team that would be in a similar position? Hi, um, thank you for that question, Pierre-Olivier. Uh, so as you mentioned, we had a limited opportunity to gain an understanding of the context. So we based our assessment of how to manage the risk on a lot of research. And we did also, um, after that field trip had to be cancelled, we kind of shifted our focus to widen our case study review and also extend the number of kind of interviews we were carrying out with experts in hydroelectricity and who might have familiarity with the Central Asia region. So I would probably just advise somebody else doing this to um, expand the scope of those kinds of meetings even further. So in that process, we actually managed to speak to experts at the International Hydropower Association who are themselves soon commencing a project in Tajikistan and were working, for example, with the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, we, we gained insights as well, for example, from uh, experts at Export Development Canada who did have familiarity with the region. So there are workarounds um, to kind of increase the exposure and gain understanding of the context in other ways. So I would probably just recommend trying to do more of that. Um, but obviously the, the circumstances weren't necessarily what was originally planned. 